Hello everyone. This is our 14th lecture. It's about logistic regression, or in other words, a GLM with a binomial distribution and a logit link. You can imagine why we call it logistic regression for short. As a reminder, one of the reasons why we're going to talk about logistic regression is OLS doesn't fit this scenario very well. Now that logistic regression works when you have an outcome that's binary, where it's 0 or 1, and OLS is going to try to fit a straight line to that. And there are there is information that we can get out of that, but there are issues with it as well. Now, as a reminder, the uh, idea of a GLM is basically a regression, but where you wrap up the outcome in a link function. It's this hug that changes what it looks like. And it makes it so we can basically use regular logistic regression to understand the information even when the distribution doesn't normally work for regression. In logistic regression, we, we work with this sigmoid curve, this curve right here that you see in this plot where it has this S shape to it. This fits the data a lot better and has some nice probability uh, attributes. Uh, the issue with it is that we need to give more consideration about how we interpret the information. Now, if you remember from our previous lecture, the logistic regression uses what's called a logit link which is the log odds. Once it wraps up the outcome in that link, then everything else is just like regular regression other than our outcome is going to be assumed to have this binomial distribution. But the log odds can be a confusing thing. And so we're gonna talk about what that means and how we can work with that. The way that we're actually going to interpret it is using what's called the odds ratios. This is one of the ways. And it's just exponentiating the coefficient, so it's exponentiating the log odds, and it turns it into an odds ratio. To help you really understand this, you need to consider, first of all, what are odds? Well, odds are just what I was showing on that other slide. It's a probability divided by 1 minus a probability. So we can try this example where we have, what are the odds of winning if your probability of winning is 60%? So we have 0.6 on the top divided by one minus 0.6. So it's 0.6 divided by 0.4, which gives you 1.5. So the odds of winning is 1.5 if your probability of winning is 60%. With that information, what does the odds of one, what does that mean about our probability of winning? Well, if the odds are one, that means the probability and one minus the probability is exactly the same, which means it's 50%. So the odds of one means that it's equally likely to lose and win. When the odds are above one, that means you have more of a chance of winning than losing. And if they're below one, then it's the opposite. You have more of a chance of losing than winning. With that in mind, the, the odds ratio is actually just a ratio of odds. So if you think about that, odds are a ratio of probabilities. The odds ratio is a ratio of odds, so it's a ratio of ratios, which can be confusing uh, at first. Uh, as you get more comfortable with odds ratios, it starts to make more sense. But consider this example just to try to get you into that frame of mind. The odds ratio, again, is a ratio of odds. So we have this situation. What is the odds ratio of winning when you are older than 65, where your probability is 60%, compared to when you are younger than 65, where your probability is 20%. And 
we already looked what the odds are when your probability is 60%, that's 1.5. We can get the odds for when our probability is 20%, that's going to be 0.25 is the result for that one. And then it, we just divide, so it's point, or it's 1.5 divided by 0.25, which gives us an odds ratio of six. So when someone is older than 65, their odds are six times higher to win than if you're younger than 65. You can think about the odds ratios that way that it is a comparison of two things and it's going to be a comparison of how big the odds are in one group than the other. So if your odds ratio is six, then you would say the odds of winning when you're older than 65 is six times higher than when you're younger than 65 or 600% higher. Those, those mean the same thing. Odds ratios are really central to using logistic regression. So basically, no matter what field you're in, you're going to be using odds ratios. So it's really good to get comfortable with what they, those mean and what they're saying. Next thing is the average marginal effects. And these average the effect across all of the possible values of x in the sample and give you the average of those. I'll show you what, them, what that looks like shortly, but it is interpreted just like regular regression, regular OLS. It just averages across all of the possible effects that are happening. The last one is the predicted probabilities, and this is essentially just talking about where the line is. So the line's a curve, so it's hard to explain it with just a single value, but you can actually point out what the probability is at various levels of our x variable. So we could say the probability when x1 is zero in this case is somewhere around 60%. So that, that's one way to interpret it. Another way is just to show the graph. Predicted probabilities, you can just show the graph of the predicted probabilities like I do here. Personally, I think that's an awesome way to show what the relationship looks like. But then the question comes up after we've made the interpretations is how good is the model anyway? And there's two main ways to understand how good the model fits to the data, how well it explains the outcome. The first one is a whole group of uh, measures which are called pseudo R squareds. And these try to act like R squared for logistic regression. And there's a number of types, and I recommend you go to that link to learn more about the different types. They all have shortcomings, they all have strengths. They're things definitely to look at and understand, and a lot of journals expect you to report it. So it's good to get to know those. The other is the prediction accuracy, which is basically a bunch of ways of asking how well do our predictors end up predicting our outcome. And there's a lot of ways of measuring this, including accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, etc. We're going to go into these into more detail in just a moment. But these two versions, the pseudo R squared and prediction accuracy, are two perspectives of how to talk about how good the model is. When it comes to the prediction accuracy, there's lots of ways of defining how accurate your model is. The first one is the misclassification, right? This is talking about how often your model is wrong. And so if we, we're gonna be working with this table above here and we have the predicted negative, the predicted positive, so that is what your model thinks is the answer. So if your model thinks that it's a zero, then that's a predicted negative. If it thinks it's a positive, then it's a predicted positive. On the rows, you have the actual negative and actual positive. So this is what is actually in the data. So across the top we have, or the columns, we're gonna have what the model thinks. The rows, we're gonna have what is actually true. 
So in the upper left hand, we have the true negative where the model is correct about it being negative. In the far bottom right, we have true positive, which means when the model is correct about it being a positive. And then the two other areas we are seeing where the model is wrong. There's a false negative and a false positive. The false negative is when the model thinks it's negative, but it's actually positive. A false positive is when the model thinks it's positive, but it's actually negative. So the misclassification rate is just basically summing up all the times the model is wrong, divided by all of them together. Your accuracy is just the opposite of that. It's one minus the misclassification rate, which is just basically all the times that it was accurate divided by everything. And those are the two most basic. In addition to those, we have sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, and negative predictive value. The sensitivity is essentially saying how many of the actual positives do we classify as positive? So you have the true positive divided by the true positive plus the false negative. Again, the sensitivity is how many of the actual positives do we classify as positives? Specificity is how many of the actual negatives do we classify as negative? So we have the true negative divided by the true negative plus the false positive. Again, that means how many of the actual negatives do we classify as negative? When we come over to the positive predictive value, this one seems similar, but it's not. Instead, we're looking at how many of the predictive positives are actually positive. So we're looking at all the ones where the model thinks they're positive and looking at how many of those are actually truly positive. When it comes to the negative predictive value, this is asking how many of the predicted negatives are actually negative. So we have how many the model uh, thinks are negative. Of all of those, how many were actually truly negative? So combined, sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, and negative predictive value tell you basically the whole story of this data. It's going to talk about how good the model is, both its predictions and how well those predictions line up with actual values. The last thing to note on this slide is that these are going to take some practice. You're going to want to study this slide and get to know these well because these are going to come up in various aspects of most research programs. Generally, there's going to be some talk of sensitivity or specificity or positive predictive value or negative predictive value. In the in-class example, we're even going to go into more uh, ways that we can look at this. But overall, these are the core of what actually uh, tells us about the, the predictive value of our model itself. And while I think about it, one of the things I want to make clear is that because the outcome is either a yes or no, that is the reason why we now talk about prediction a lot more than we did in the previous stuff with regular regression because we can easily define when the model is correct about something or not correct about something. When the model thinks that it's a positive, we can see is it actually a positive or not, which gives us these new measures that we can use. With all that in mind, Here's an example to kind of walk through a few of the things. So let's say you are approached by a distinguished researcher who wants to, you to help her analyze data on poverty, violent crime, and teen birth rates in the United States. And of course you enthusiastically say, of course I'll help. So you find out that you're trying to predict high versus low violent crime. So it's a binary outcome. With the state's population, which is a continuous predictor, the poverty level, which is a continuous predictor, and high versus low team birth rate, which is a binary predictor. So what approach do we use? Well, of course, logistic regression, since that's a topic of the lecture. And if we do that, this would be our output. So we have the high violence as our outcome, 
So high violence is a one, low violence is zero on that variable. We have poverty percent, the census, which is the population, and then the high teen birth rate, which is a binary predictor. We can look at each of these and understand what each of them are saying in general. So poverty percent is saying for a one unit increase in the percent of poverty, there's a 0.2 increase in the log odds of having high violence. Now note that this is not a significant effect. The p-value is 0.1, so we don't have any significance there. The next one is census. This one is the population, so for every one unit increase in the population, there's a 0 0.0000029 unit increase in the log odds of having high violence, which even though that's a really small value, the census is per individual, so it's just adding one person to the population it looks like it does increase your odds, and that is significant at uh, the 0.05 level. And then we have this one, which is a binary, so it's comparing to high team birth rate. So this is low team birth rate comparing to high. And what we have is compared to high, the lower team birth rate places are negative two log odds units lower than high team birth rate places of being a high violent place, and that is significant. Now note, the log odds aren't telling you a ton, but the direction does tell you something. So if it's positive, that means when you're increasing that value, it's increasing the probability overall of being a yes, where a negative is saying that it's decreasing the probability of being a yes. Remember, those aren't probability units, those are log odds units, but the direction does communicate that. So let's get the odds ratios to start to interpret. So we can use the odds ratios function from the EDUC 7610 package. So we just put our model in there and we get the odds ratios out with the corresponding confidence intervals. So we have the 95% confidence interval there. So what we can see is poverty percent, it's a, it has an odds ratio of 1.22. And its confidence interval goes from 0.98 to 1.62. And the confidence interval with odds ratios it's telling you it's not significant when it crosses the one. So in this case, it goes from 0.98, crosses one, and goes to 1.62, so poverty percent's not significant. But if it were significant, what it would mean is for a one unit increase in poverty percent, there's a 22% increase in the odds of being a high violence place of having high violence in that state. So again, for the poverty percent, for a one unit increase in poverty percentage, there's a 1.22 times change in the odds of having high violence. Note that before I said there's a 22% increase in the odds of having high violence. Those mean the same thing. For the census, this one even though it's really close to one, it never crosses one. It goes from 1.0000008 to 1.0000006, so it never crosses the one. It is significant. Notably, all of these are controlling for the other variables, just like we were working with before. And I should have said that for the previous ones, even the log odds that's controlling for those other variables. And now we get to the high teen birth. And this one, again, does not cross one, the confidence interval, it's 0.009 to 0.41. And its value is 0.077. So notably, when the odds ratio is below one, 
the rely the reliability of that measured it doesn't work quite as well so one way that we could fix this is by switching the reference group that would turn the odds ratio above one but a quick interpretation of this one would be the places with lower teen birth are we do one minus that value so it's 0.92 we would say places with lower teen birth are 92 have odds that are 92% lower than places with high teen birth rate. And again, the interpretation for the high teen birth for the lower, this is another way of saying exactly what I said before. Compared to higher teen birth, lower teen birth states have odds that are 0.08 times the odds of having high violence. Next is the average marginal effect. Uh, this one uh, produces the AME for each factor. And it also gives us lower and upper confidence intervals and provides a p-value. And so here, oddly enough, the census one, because its unit is one individual added to the population, it looks like a really small effect, but it's still significant. Uh, what we could do to make that one more interpretable is we could put it into units of a thousand or a million. We could say for every million increase in the population or every thousand increase in the population. And that would give us more meaningful units for the census one for the AME. Here, with the high teen birth lower, the AME means that the lower states with a lower teen birth rate have a probability of being in a high violent state that's 0 0.41 units lower, which is pretty large. That's saying compared to states with high team birth, if that state was like 50% likely to be in a high violent place, places with low team birth is 41% lower than that, or percentage points lower than that, so it'd be about 9%. So if we were in a 50% state with high team birth, if we were in a low team birth, it would lower to 9% of being in a high violent state. The poverty percent means for a one unit increase in the poverty percentage, there's a 0 0.02 unit increase in the probability of being in a high crime place. And again, the census, if that had better units, we would interpret that very similarly to the poverty percent. And again, I have those written out for you, for you to see again. And then last, we have the predicted probabilities. We can usually plot these. It's a great way to show them. And the line is the predicted probability. That line shows for each percentage point of poverty, there's a certain probability of being in a high violence state. So when the percent of poverty is around 10, our probability of being in a high violence state is about 25%. When our poverty percent is more like 20%, then our probability of being in a high violence state is like 90%. Similarly, we can do that with the team birth rate. When the team birth rate is uh, a one, which in this case was a lower team birth rate, it means our probability was around, um, the line is being covered up, so it's about 0.2-ish. When the team birth rate is high, which is zero in this case, then the probability of being in a high violence state is 0.8 or 80%. So after interpreting all that, we need to consider how good is this model though? We got some information out. It looks like uh, the team birth rate is highly predictive of violence. The poverty percentage isn't quite significant, but it's related to it in the sample. And then you also have the population of the state, and that correlates with it too. 
So we have this information that we got out, but the question is how good is this model? So let's check some model fit and some assumptions and extreme values and, and see what we find. So first, we can check our Cook's distance by using this code. We just put in our model fit and we say which equals four and that tells us, tells R to plot the Cook's distance. And what we see is there's a few that are have a little bit higher Cook's distance, but nothing huge. The one that has the highest is Alaska. So that is a point that's more influential than the others. So that's something to keep in mind that maybe Alaska has some certain aspects about it that makes it influential in this, in this sample. We also can get the model data out using this augment function from the broom package. And it gives us our model's residual, our standardized residual, our hat value, and our predicted values. So it does a lot of work for us. And using that information, we can look at the fitted, which is the predicted values, from and how they relate to the poverty and the census and the high team birth. And we can look at if it looks like there's a linear relationship and if there's homoscedasticity based on these plots. We're also gonna be able to see that in the, the upcoming plot as well. But the fitted is on the original scale on the log odds scale. So it's a continuous measure in this one. And what we can see is poverty percent looks like it has a fairly linear relationship until the very end. So there may be some outliers, maybe the place that has a 25% poverty rate, which is really huge, maybe an outlier, maybe bringing it down so that it's not a fully linear relationship. With the census, it looks pretty linear. There's a little hump in the middle, but it's pretty linear overall. And then the high team birth, it's categorical. What we're looking for is that the uh, variance between the two areas is roughly the same. You're seeing a little bit more variance in the higher team birth than the lower, uh, but it doesn't look like it's massively different. We can look at this another way where we're looking at our standardized residuals across poverty percent census and the high team birth. And what we're looking for is our blue line to match up with the dotted line in these cases. And there's a little bit of discrepancy there. There's probably some issues with linearity, especially with poverty percent, maybe a tiny bit with census. Uh, and with poverty percent, we may have an issue of homoscedasticity because we have a lot of variability on the lower end of poverty percent and not very much on the high end. When you get to the census, you're seeing a similar pattern where there's high variability on the lower end and less on the upper end. So with this in mind, one of the things that we might consider trying with poverty percent is maybe we should take the log of it or something related to that, some transformation to make it more of a linear fit and to help with the homoscedasticity. Another option would be to use robust standard errors instead, uh, which could just account for the homoscedasticity and just assume that this is linear enough. We also can plot the hat values. So from our data that we got from the augment function, there's a dot hat variable, and we can see if any of them have a high hat value, which if you remember, corresponds to leverage. And there doesn't seem to be anything that's really uh, different from the others. So I, I don't think we have any major issues with that one. Another thing to check with logistic regression is what's called a confusion matrix or a cross tab. This is looking at the outcome and the predicted values. So across the, the rows is the true outcome, across the top is the predicted. And so across the red diagonal, those are all the incorrect ones. Across the uh, green diagonal, that's the correct ones. And it's actually from this table that we're going to get all the information about sensitivity 
specificity, etc. However, there's an even better way to get even more information out, and that's by using an ROC curve. And we're going to use the Rocket library. I know, funny. Uh, we're going to use the measure at function. What we give it is the predicted probabilities. We give it the outcome, which is just the binary yes or no. And then we tell it some measures. And here we're asking for accuracy, misclassification, sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, and negative predictive value. And what this will give you is values for not just at the 0.5 cutoff. And I didn't miss say that. It's not 0.05, it's 0.5 for probability. So for the 0.5, where we're saying if it's above 0.5, then the model predicts that that's a one or a yes. When it's below 0.5, then it predicts that it's a no. But this is going to give us at a bunch of cutoffs. It's going to say, well, if we draw the cutoff at 0.1, so if it's at 0.1 or higher, then it's a yes. Below 0.1, it's a no. And we're just going to draw those multiple times all the way up. And so we actually can see how the accuracy, the sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, and negative predictive value change as we adjust where that cutoff is. But if we look just around the 0.5 cutoff, so probability of 50% or more is a, a yes, below that's a no. This is actually a pretty good model. Our accuracy is 83% which means our misclassification is 17%. And then our sensitivity is 84, specificity is 81, positive predictive values 81, and negative predictive values 84. Now note, this is just a chance. These don't always mirror each other. That 84, 84, 81, 81, that's not always gonna happen. Uh, that just happened to be in this case. Now lastly, there's some important things to consider. These values are on the data the model used. So the model learned from this data and is predicting on that same data. So it's kind of like peeking at all the cards before playing a card game. So it's giving you a heads up. The model is likely to be right because it learned information from that data. So one way to work around that is called cross-validation. And this can help you if you're interested in the generalizability of the model predictions. If you're not just interested in interpreting the model and understanding just generally how well it fits the data, then cross-validation isn't always necessary. But if you're interested in the actual prediction of the model, cross-validation is almost always necessary. And we're gonna talk about that in a lot of detail in lecture 17, our last lecture of the class. And that is it for this lecture. Uh, hopefully you have a good view of what logistic regression is, how to interpret it, and how to check how good that model is. Uh, we'll be working through some examples in the in-class activity to show you a few other ways of doing, uh, a few other examples of doing logistic regression and how that can be checked, how things can go wrong, and how things can look good.